Hey there, friends. I hope that you enjoy this episode of the Remembering and Reenchanting podcast as much as I enjoyed making it. I want to take a moment here at the beginning to extend a special offer, an invitation to you, our dear listeners, to join the Remembering course. Our next start date is going to be in the middle of March. This is a powerful, deeply moving, and for many people, transformational experience into the heart of colonization, climate change, family histories, ancestors, and so many other critical intersecting pieces. Just visit our website, Sequoia Samanvaya. All the information is in the link below. Hello, and welcome to the Remembering and Reenchanting podcast. My name is Sarah Jolina Wolcott, and I am your hostess on this sacred learning journey of unraveling, unveiling, and becoming more fully alive at the end of the world as we know it. In this podcast, we offer up to you, dear listener, three forms of episodes to support your journey of remembering and re-enchanting. First, conversations with amazing people. Second, storytelling. And third, myth casting. This episode is in the form of storytelling. These are real life stories where I'm sharing part of my journey that led to certain insights and realizations which have significantly shaped my teaching and the work at the Sequoia Summon via learning community which I started. Hello, my name is Sarah Jelena Wolcott, and I want to welcome you to the Remembering and Reenchanting podcast. In this, the dark time of year, somewhere between winter solstice and late January's lunar new year, when the northern hemisphere is just beginning to turn towards the light of summer, when the hustle and bustle of the days has quieted, and people are more prone to light candles and quietly reflect on their lives. The ancient cyclical temporal rhythms and the fecund darkness and the inquiries into calendars, temporal cycles, and linear timelines and the meaning of goals and progress all come together. The ancient cycle and the modern linear ways look at one another in the darkness of the night and perhaps even kiss. And we who may all too often feel trapped in the unending pressure of progress and outputs, goals, and the inevitability of falling short of a measurement we never really can live up to anyways, can begin to see a bridge towards a different way of living, a living infused with remembering. This is a time of origin stories, of thinking about beginnings and cosmovisions, where the planetary movements, the wonders brought to us from the visions of outer space, and the orbit of our own spheres of influence can be charted, and where they do indeed intertwine, sometimes even collide. I dare say this podcast is an exploration, perhaps even a bit like a sermon, of these intersections. And I hope it helps you to think about some of these stories and this time of year and the intersections of circular time and linear time, even the distinction between the two, what that might mean for you in this year and this particular cycle of your life, wherever it might find you differently. Before I go deeper into this journey, I want to make to you a clear invitation 
I invite you to join me for a circular time reflection this year. Circular time courses, as I teach them, are guided processes to look at your previous annual cycle around the sun. It's a powerful process, and participants over the last five years that I have been teaching them describe it as peaceful, grounded, bringing greater satisfaction and clarity about patterns and directions in their own lives. They almost always say how it has helped to connect them more closely to their ecological and their local seasons, as well as to the movement of planets and their social and political and economic lives. You can sign up via the link in the show notes at our website, sequoiasamanvaya.com dash circular time. And if you are listening to this at a time when you cannot um, make it at the time periods that we have available on Saturday, January 7th and Thursday, January 12th, I do offer private sessions for individuals, friendship groups, or organizations who are interested in going deeper into their own personal explorations of circular time. It's a powerful process. It's simple. It's relatively short. It's relatively inexpensive. I hope you will join me. And now let us go straight into this podcast. I want to start with a song and a poem. You may know it by Wendell Berry. To know the dark. I first learned, first heard really, this in song form. I'm going to try to sing it to you to the best of my ability on this relatively cold winter morning. To go in the dark with the light is to know the light. To know the dark, go dark, go with outside. And find that the dark too blooms and sings and is traveled by dark feet and dark wings. To go in the dark with the light is to know the light, to know the light, to know the dark, go dark, go without sight, and find that the dark too blooms and sings and is traveled by dark feet and dark wings. Ah, Thank you, Wendell Berry. There is something we cannot know in the light. There is a knowledge that dwells without sight. There is a knowing within the darkness, an animate world, alive with some of the same cycles of breath and song and death as there is in the light, but which creates its own world. There is a knowledge of and in darkness, distinct from the light, a knowledge that the light actually blinds us from perceiving. In darkness, there is a world of vibrational qualities of touch and sound, where the soma, bodies, senses, and knowings, ancient receptive qualities are valued alongside heart and mind. Darkness can return us to our contemplating our origins, At the time of year when the night is long and the day is short, the northern hemisphere contemplates beginnings, the end of one year and the beginning of the next. Here, linearity, time, periods, the Gregorian calendar kisses the cycles of earth time. Amidst calendars and candles and family meals, we return to traditions to what we seek to continue, to what we seek to discontinue, to that which has been transmitted across generations. And with the reassertion of tradition, we look back to the beginning. In the time of year associated with endings and beginnings, we return to the dark of the womb where sound and touch reverberate together, to the beginnings of our communications between and amidst different beings, ourselves and our mother, ourselves and the universe to the dark world of bulbs and seas and roots and worms and mycelium networks and fungi, of spores and spirits and mysterious communications known in our bellies, in our soil, in all of our stories, to the dark world of eros, 
queering its way through a wild and twisted forest, loving monsters and fairies alike. So much begins in the darkness. So much begins in the darkness. So much begins in the darkness like Genesis. In the King James Version of the Holy Bible, the first book of Genesis is scrolled. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, in the way of cultural memory, we tend to focus on that last phrase, God said, let there be light, and there was light. But it is the phrase before that is so relevant to today's journey. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In the beginning, there was darkness. God here is not himself a beam of light. The deity depicted in this old creation story is of a being who dwells and moves with comfort and grace, perhaps even with dark feet and dark wings in darkness. The water seemed primordial to light, perhaps even a being in its own right, a being that feels like a feminine pair to the masculinity, the pronouns that have been passed down to us in the traditions of the story. It is reminiscent of the room. The verb highlighted here, movement, suggests something now well understood and explained in physics that the foundation of the universe is one of movement and dynamism. A contemporary understanding of the Big Bang Theory and the origins of our collective universe suggests a similar understanding of some kind of dynamic movement in darkness, and then light comes forth from vibration like sound waves. We come from darkness, and to darkness we shall return. The waters of the womb and the spirit of life that dwell there the darkness of which echoes the reverberations of darkness in the tomb, and where the circle of the rosary reminds us is where the sacred feminine Mary stands. She stands before an angel whom we tend to associate with light, and the light speaks to the watery darkness within her. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And then, later, for centuries, old men and women and young ones too would feel these beads, They go in circles, orbiting in their hands. Hail Mary, full of grace, pray for us at the hours of our death. The words go round and round, from womb to hours, to grace to tomb. A recognition of a cycle, and of the feminine presence of one who can enter the darkness with us. She who knows the Madonna of the dark. And the darkness has a life of its own, a presence. A presence that the ancient ancestors of the Hebrew tradition recognized as sacred and capable of immense creativity. In darkness dwells our origins and our ancestors and the beloved dead. In his book, Waking to the Dark, the Black Madonna Gospel for an Age of Extinction and Collapse, Clark Strand writes, The dead are still there in the dark. Their voices speak in the language of dreams or through the owls and fireflies. They speak through the weather and stir briefly like a breeze in the window, in the spaces that open between thoughts in the middle of the night. Every plant, animal, and insect alive on the planet today is linked to ancestral mothers and fathers without end, and every cell has ancestors too. Even the mountains and valleys and deserts, the streams and the oceans have ancestors. Everything that exists now because of what has come before, but that doesn't mean it's gone. Nothing comes or goes, least of all life in all of its myriad forms. All time is ancestral time. We stand on top, mothers and fathers without end. Waking up in the dark helps us to remember that great reality and helps us to remain connected to it once we do.
dead are still there in the dark. Our ancestors are in the dark, and we who are alive are in both the dark and the light, cycling as our planet cycles, as our sun cycles, as our galaxy cycles and moves, and in so moving creates time. In this, there's at least some resonance between the ancient myth and the understandings of modern physics. From my reading of Stephen Hawking's excellent book, A Brief History of Time, time as part of the space-time continuum is very much a function of the dynamic relationship between bodies such as planets and solar systems and the continuing expansion of the universe, including the continuing expansion of light. From the perspective of us two-legged creatures and a medium-sized, precious blue planet orbiting the sun, our experience of time is shaped by the cycles of darkness and light. In the book of Genesis, the utterance, the cycle of the sound wave, of God's words comes day and night, the first demarcation of time. With light comes the first day and the first night. We are need both. We are of both. We are of the cycle. In other words, time is deeply inherently connected to space, which is another way of saying that time is connected to place. Places are distinct. Each ecosystem is its own system. It's part of why time is relative. Space-time curves. The universe is dynamic, ever-moving, both expanding and falling apart according to the laws of entropy and coming together again, leading to the now taken for granted truths of relativity and the critical importance of, you got it, relationships, relationality. There is no absolute constant, but perhaps in this pattern and this consistency of movement, there is something that's not particularly absolute, but is utterly dependable maybe sometimes even chronic, certainly supportive. Yes, that orbit, never perfect, never exactly the same as the one before, that spiral through which we move, through which we grow old, through which we fall apart and become like a child again. Even God, whom I might add, Isaac Newton himself, very much wanted to be an absolute constant, which might have come from an age of an absolute image of God perpetuated by the church at the time, when, which was not particularly in line with those few, line, few phrases of Genesis, exists in movement. Yes, God exists in movement. There is something so basic and foundational, much of these Physics is taught in middle school classrooms across much of the world, shared through the stories of Einstein imagining himself on a beam of light and how old would he be if he got back in comparison to everyone else. We don't always think about it. We don't tend to realize how it aligns with millennia of indigenous wisdom about the nature of time and space. We often experience time in the abstract, not as embodied, with the obvious exception of aging, which is surely one of the ways we must personally experience the laws of entropy. Einstein's observation that two twins, one at the top of the mountain, one in the valley, will age differently over the course of their lifetime, becomes the subject of physics, perhaps biology, for the perceptual difference between the t- twin who lives on the mountain and the twin who lives in the valley, if they get together, they know their lifetime is pretty small. There are so many other factors that influence aging other than the preciseness of where you live and the way that Einstein was referring to where you live not talking here about the social determinants of health, but instead that the simple geography, because places make such a significant difference. Now, if we go from the macro rotations of the planet to the micro rotations of life in a given ecosystem, and I come back here, wherever you here is for you. For myself, that is my home amidst the rolling hills of the Hudson Valley and the homelands of the Mohican and Mahican peoples near the river that runs both ways, also known as the Hudson River, also known as that very big river right near my home. These pastoral lands are part of the north historical northeast woodlands of what is now the United States. 
the great annual highly significant regular occurrence of the transition from one season to another which so shapes this valley is not determined by some gigantic clock in the fields that is watched by the birds and the bees and the clouds. The climatic events of one season shifting towards another season are embedded in life that thrives here. Geese fly south, trees lose their leaves, and the seeds bury themselves into the darkness of the earth. The experience of the changing of times is a changing of the relationships between all of these beings. Our local ecology, including the seasons, be that a monsoon season in Southeast Asia, or the wet and dry seasons in California, or the light and dark times of the year in northern Norway, deeply influence our sense of time and the patterns in which we live our lives. When I was researching sustainable systems in Kenya, I once asked a farmer how he knew when to plant. He pointed to a cluster of trees a little ways away from where we sat overlooking his fields. When a particular bird comes and lands in my fields, he said, often they will rest in those trees for a while. After I have not seen the bird from that previous season, the birds always come three days before the rainfall. That is how I know when to plant. Then he paused. He spread his hands out a bit, palms up, as if asking the heavens for support, and he heaved a big sigh. Until now. Now the birds came, but the rain doesn't follow them. He shook his head. His normally buoyant smile was completely gone, his face drawn down, as if the weight of what he was saying was more than his muscles could stand. Looking at me, he tried to smile again and said as if attempting some humor for medicine. I don't know what the gods are thinking. The phrase climate change barely conveys the cosmological significance of it. Even the gods must be crazy. The farmer's generational knowledge is an aspect of what anthropologists call ecological calendars, temporal technologies held in traditional ecological knowledge systems around the world, from foragers to farmers to forest cultivators, that contain the knowledge of what to do with what season based on the movements and interactions of the plants and animals and the shifts in the weather. I'm going to be doing an interview for this podcast soon with Lila Jean Johnson, and we're going to be going deep into some of the traditional ecology knowledge and art and the multiplicity of food systems and indigenous cultures and what is now referred to as the Americas. Traditional ecological knowledge and the ecological calendars that are part of that offer a deeply reflective understanding of time. In the Haudenosaunee tradition, the celebration of the maple trees, and thus the period when people begin collecting sap, begins when the sap begins to flow from the tree. Depending upon the depth of the winter, this can vary widely year to year. It is not a specific date in the calendar, so sometimes one temporal season is much shorter than it is the next year, which makes complete sense when you are paying as much attention as you need to to what is happening around you, when your livelihoods, spiritualities, and social rituals are embedded into your ecology. Ecological calendars rely in part upon oral tradition and a wealth of storytelling, the certain information about floods, droughts, which plants grow when. According to anthropologist Kassam at Cornell University, who has been working with indigenous peoples throughout the Middle East as well as here in North America, where are often highly vulnerable climates, ecological calendars are absolutely essential to enabling greater adaptation to climate change. As Kassam explains, ecological calendars vary capacity to experience times relational, dynamic, fluid, and embedded within living systems as part of what makes them so important to a dynamic, changing ecosystem, which becomes even more important with a changing planet. Time is relational. Cycles are dependable, but also in flux. The great conversation between species and the logos that shapes the world is occurring in time. Time is somatic, ecological, embedded, dynamic, heartbeats and wing beats and wind song. Not a fixed constant, but still dependable and known to birds and trees and rain clouds alike, discernible by humans until now. Climate change means that times are literally changing. 
traditional ecological knowledge and their associated ecological calendars can help, especially as Kassam discusses when integrated with some of the scientific models, he holds out for both the practice and the hope of integrating science and traditional knowledge. But to do that, you have to appreciate the ancient and the indigenous knowledge. You have to be able to get out of a linear time frame, but out of the tick-tock of the culture and the deadlines imposed by someone somewhere else. Most people today whom we reference with the temporal term modern or even postmodern, which is a whole discussion in of itself I'm not going to get into today, have become far more obsessed with clock time, a variation of linear time, which has little consideration for natural cycles. Such attitudes are a far cry from our ancestors. It's a far cry from the wisdom of darkness from which light arises and to which we will return. Our oldest surviving ancestral calendars are those standing calendars made of stone. The oldest that we have record of is in the southern part of the Nile on the Nubuia plains in Egypt. A rough circle, really more of an oval, of standing stones that charted the planetary rhythms of the solstices and the equinox. It also charted the monsoon season, and quite likely, based on our current understanding of how memory becomes embedded in to places and stone structures and a fair amount of research which has gone into that, which is also the topic of another time. It was a place of meaning making and storytelling. Now these standing circle calendars were at once astronomical, astrological, and related to local ecological events and places for collective storytelling and meaning making. I can't think of anything quite like that in today's world. Planetariums today can help situate participants in the vastness of time and space, and invoking wonder, they can also evoke a sense of belonging. But do they rarely ever connect to the local seasons and ecologies, or the meaning-making of what it means to live in a particularity of the place where we are now? These old multidimensional calendars brought people to the heavens and back again, to the outer ring of the sense of their ecological belonging and back again, to the social and cultural and spiritual movements of their lives, and I like to imagine back again to their own families and individual selves, guided by the world of myth. Our ancient ancestors standing beside the gates of Stonehenge in England or the plain Nubia stones in Egypt, in Mesoamerica pyramids or Southeast Asia, stood or lay or sat back to back and watched the stars and observed the seasons and created mythological cosmovisions which linked all of them, celestial and local and social, before to come right now. In these reliable temporal rhythms, they found something we often do not. The east was the east and the west was the west and they were in the center. Time was tied to space and it was all cyclical, intricate geographical and mythological worlds dance together in mirror image because the mind is part of the soil of the earth, which is part of the stars in the cosmos. They were not only individuals, but reflecting also their kin, the somas, social and ecological, ecorotic and sacred. Given how valuable and important ecological calendars are, and how ancient circular calendars are, we might find ourselves asking the question, how do we get away from them? First, let me say something else that I keep hinting at. Calendars are bridges between cosmovisions and daily life, between cultural philosophies and everyday practice. The expression, if we don't put something into our calendar, it won't happen, is in part a recognition that to go from an idea to reality, we need to work with and in time. It's actually the inverse of what I was just talking about in some ways, because so far as we can tell, so many um, of the pre-colonial and pre-industrial societies 
Time was always, well, frequently at least, there's so many variations of what humans can do. I don't like to say always, but certainly often embodied. So time arose from the soma, not from simply an idea. And then not just an idea that we put into time, but from time arises the idea. It hints at the recognition that calendars are social. They serve as rough agreements between different actors, movements of bodies in and through and with time. Less obvious is the extent to which our contemporary civic and other collective calendars are based on shared assumptions about what is valuable, what is considered work, and how we live our lives. Disagreements about how we shape the calendar quite literally, how we visually portray it, as well as what goes into the calendar are disagreements about identity, values, and what stories, especially histories, myths, and seasonal cycles, that we believe matter. One simple example is the somewhat contentious American holiday, increasingly referenced to as Indigenous People Day, still known by many Americans by its conventional name as in Columbus Day. Columbus Day itself is a relatively new insertion into the American civic calendar, entered into the ca- um, through an extensive lobbying on behalf of a small group of Italian Americans in the late 19th century, at a time when Italian immigrants faced widespread persecution. But in doing so, they were holding the initiator of mass genocide, Columbus, and ecological destruction in America on a pedestal. The holiday came to symbolize, especially amongst Native peoples and their friends, not the importance of Italians, but the ugly and horrifying aspect of American history that continues to dismember the experience and lived realities of Native peoples. There has been an increasing movement to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day and to celebrate Indigenous peoples' histories. Now, the shift here is a shift of different stories. It's a shift of different worldviews. It's a shift of a different understanding of history. Who was Columbus? An Italian who discovered the Americas? Or the bringer of genocide who destroyed the people and led to an onslaught of multiple forms of genocide to the animals, plants, ecosystems as well, of who were always here. Of course, even the question of holidays brings to light the nature of the labor force, assumptions about what is an appropriate amount of work for whom. In America, federal holidays tend to fall on Mondays, enabling the much-beloved three-day weekend, which assumes that that is the way of organizing labor that people find appealing. It has its own history, the five-day work week and the two-day weekend. It assumes that most Americans are employed by organizations that have the ability or obligation to give them time off, such as a three-day weekend, and that the 10 public holidays scattered throughout the year are sufficient. Contrast this to Myanmar, which has 32 public holidays, several of last, several of which last for five to eight days. Given that the American cosmovision is based on the sense that a fair amount of people should be working all the time, coming in part both through the linear temporal understanding of progress, which is one of our top values, and the Protestant work ethic, which goes together, and a general fear of laziness, rest, sickness, and leisure, it is part of a cosmovision of work and leisure that is mediated through the collective calendar. So we've begun to see at least a few ways that calendars enact cosmovisions. Now, let us go a little bit deeper into how times become disconnected from ecosystems or places in our lived experience and in the ways in which that we are arranging our calendars and planning for our future. That question itself is not dissimilar to a related question that I suspect that many of you have probably thought about much more deeply. How did Western society or European society and modern society become to be so disassociated 
from earth, from place. How have people become so disassociated from place? One simple answer is that people became unearthed both from time and place due to the large levels of disassociation, dismembering, disembodiment, and displacement that happened in the early modern era that was preceded by colonization and the subsequent industrial revolution. We can trace some of the theological and practical aspects of that to the Middle Ages in Europe, but much can be laid at the foot at the Christian doctrine of discovery with its theology of superiority and separation, which especially impacted Europe, Africa, and the Americas simultaneously in the 1500s. Those of you who have taken my remembering course are familiar with this as it relates to places and a little bit about time, but let's circle around and go a bit deeper. Indigenous scholar and historian Dr. Donald Fixico sees the Western mind as a linear mind. The indigenous mind, he writes, is more of a circular mind. Linear time is part of a linear mind. Circular time is part of a circular mind. Linear time in the linear mind focuses on causality. A leads to B leads to C. The indigenous mind, Fixico argues, is asking a different set of questions. It is more focused on relationships and experience. He writes, Indian thinking is seeing things from a perspective that emphasizes that cycles and circles are central to the world and that all things are related within the universe. Now, before going further down this critique, I want to be clear that time itself, so far as we know, is actually far more akin to a multidimensional spiral than a circle. If one was to take the almost impossible position of standing upon, standing above the spiral of space-time and looking down at our planet circling through the solar system, which is itself cycling around in our galaxy, or in some other way, try to flatten the multidimensional spiral into two-dimensional space, such as through drawing shapes on a particular piece of paper, it would look like a circle. When I guide people through circular calendar work, and they are holding pens and writing on paper, I encourage them to keep a small space between the beginning of one year and the end of the next to represent the spiral dynamic. The year doesn't actually touch in the sense that we are not repeating what has happened in the past, although there's some philosophical questions about to what extent are we simply repeating ourselves, which is a completely valid question, absolutely worth going into, but it's not what I'm trying to get to right here. So far as I can tell, we all live with a combination of linearity and circularity. That's part of what spiral dynamics is. Shapes, such as circles or lines, are just shapes. Shapes are not inherently good or bad. When Fixico talks about a circular mind in a circular time, he is not speaking of something static, and he's not talking about walking around in circles. He's speaking about a web of relationships that has this deeply circular and cyclical dynamic. It's often talked about by indigenous thinkers, and perhaps the most famous quote that comes to mind right away, at least for me, is by Black Elk, and perhaps you know of this one. Everything an Indian does is in a circle, and that is because the power of the world always works in circles, and everything tries to be round. The sky is round, and I have heard the earth is round like a ball, and so are all the stars. The wind, in its greatest power, whirls. Birds make their nest in circles, for theirs is the same religion as ours. Fixico quotes the late Tewa anthropologist Alfonso Ortiz, who, when reflecting on space and time, said that, quote, to the best of his knowledge, none of the Pueblos has abstract terms for space and time. Time cannot be understood apart from the forces and changes in nature which give it relevance and meaning. 
It is precisely when time becomes cut up into arbitrarily abstract units, weeks, hours, minutes, seconds, that tribal people lose all similarity in their time-reckoning customs with those of Western peoples. And these smaller units of time reckoning are precise, precisely the ones which concern the Western mind the most. End quote. Time cannot be understood apart from the forces and changes in nature. Time is part of nature. We are part of nature. We are part of time. Part. Participating, participant, partake, parlay related to wholeness and distinction, not the same as everything else, but a part of it, divide, but still whole. Paradox, partition, partial, fractal, partial, take part, do your part. It's an old English word related to the French partir, to leave, to depart, to separate, but the English meaning is not only about leaving, it also retains the connection to our wholeness. In our part, our power resides. Because we are part of the flow, we can influence the flow. The disconnection from time and place are part and parcel of a vision that we now associate with modernity. The mindsets of modernity arise from industrialization, colonization, and a particular strand of Christian relationships to time and place that were amplified during the early colonial period. A key thread deep within the Western Christian European cosmovision is the notion that the place of people is outside of the sphere of life and earth looking in. I was first alerted to this by my friend, David McConville. He's done much more work than I have. A common image that he and I were looking at one time that demonstrated this, is that of a monarch holding an orb with a cross on top of it. The symbol represents the monarch's dominion over Christendom, which was the extent of their world. You might have seen this as part of the coronation ceremonies of King Charles in the late mm. 2022. It is ancient part of European Christendom. We have images of monarchs holding a similar orb dating back to 1011 AD. The orb itself is much more part of monarchy and possibly empire than Christianity per se. We have images of non-Christian Roman emperors holding similar orbs. To hold that sphere, and this is actually kind of the important part, requires that the human being is on the outside of the sphere. This is in contrast with the many, many portrayals of the sphere as and the human's position in the sphere being in the sphere. Being outside of the sphere means we're outside of not just place, but also time. It enables to be outside the sphere enables supremacy over places, temporal realities connected within places, increases the capacity to dominate those places, and lends itself to a tendency towards abstraction and linear causality. Theologically, we can associate this perspective with an abstract notion of God who is outside of time and space, thus to become more godlike, or in the case of the king, to become a bridge between the heavenly, between the between God and earth, one re- becomes removed from both time and space. Now this is becomes even more complicated or um, particular when the sense of teleos and of our end goal is to leave this place. Time, as in the grand sweep of history, is leading to an end point that is not here. Time is in the shape of an individual's life is seen as leaving earth and going to heaven. The point of being here is to not be here. So thus we have both a linear notion of time which takes us away from this world and the perspective of time and space in which the human, especially those with great power, is are outside of both time and space, capable of exerting power and influence and control over both, but somehow not actually bound 
to the rules of the time, place, universe, to the impacts of their actions, they are not within that web of life. They are not within the circularity in the cycles of the seasons. Again, I'm not saying that we necessarily have to all agree that the only place for humans is here, although, okay, I totally think that's true, but to recognize that we are deeply earthly beings and we are in this place and part of the Western heritage is a linearity and an abstraction related to time that when brought into the powers of the Industrial Revolution made a huge, huge impact. Now, I really want to be careful to nuance this history. I don't want to get caught up in what seems to be the certain popularity of just laying all the blame at the feet of Europe and European Christianity for all the evils of the modern world. In addition to that being actually wrong, it takes us away from the nuance of who we are today and what, who our ancestors were, no matter where we come from. In addition to this particular particular form of linearity and disassociation from the world, there are countless ways in which medieval Christian Europe deeply respected and adhered to cycles, including the use of circular calendars and a myriad of attempts to align actual physical church architecture and theologies within cyclical celestial movements and local ecosystems. Certainly the teachings of Jesus himself are that of a wild God whose own birth, life, rituals, and with the essence of herbs and the fermentations of plants, his suffering, passion, death, and resurrection all follows the ancient cycles of those vegetation gods akin to Dionysus who ruled, who ruled over grapes, wine, and the ritual of theater. The stories of the God-man born amongst the animals and who found solace in the darkness of the wilderness have been recognized for the cycle of their sacredness of life for all those who know how to hear and who know how to remember them. And perhaps that is why that even with some otherworldly focused theologies, it was not easy to fully break the bond between people and place. Jesus certainly never tried to. The colonization of Africa and the Americas and the witch hunts of Europe each served to further sever people from their place. As people became increasingly separated from places, they became separated from the temporal realities and rhythms that those places of relationships held. The dominion exercise in Christendom's colonization of the world, much like the Roman imperial colonization of Europe several centuries, millennia earlier, relied upon a strong sense of cultural supremacy and the capacity to self-alienate oneself from other people and places. Temporality played a critical role in global social construction. In this case, non-white Christians became backwards and less developed existing in some inferior temporal reality, denoted in part because of the lack of clocks. Traditional ecological knowledge systems were both needed by Europeans to survive and scorned as barbarian. Temporal technologies, such as the Mayan calendar system, revered as amongst the most accurate of its day, were simultaneously exalted and dismissed. Indigenous people were forced into Western notions of time. Sugar plantations possibly possible only because of the forced labor of enslaved people heralded around-the-clock production. Yes, sugar plantations changed our sense of time. Because time is embodied. Because time is embodied in our motions and how those motions relate to other motions. That sense of going faster, 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 and not being able to keep up, that sense is at least as old as slavery. And it is inhumane. Because it is impossible, and no, it is not necessary. Different temporal realities, and with them, and this is really critical, different economies are also possible. The temporal systems of the plantation absolutely shaped the Industrial Revolution. Clock towers 
which had been part of European village life for centuries, became increasingly less associated with the church and more with the town square and the factory. Factories cannot properly run without clocks. The men, women, and children who worked in those factories in Europe came to live their life by the clock. Education systems themselves in Europe and other parts of the world were designed in part to create a labor force that could work in or for factories. School bells echoed the bells in factories, and the clock in the classroom became a critical component of each class. Clock time, as some philosophies describe this era, has become the predominant way in which many people live their lives, especially in organizations, which become ruled by clock time. Daylight savings time may come and go, but either way the clock, not the sun, shapes our movements. And with the fires of industry and the wonders of electricity came the capacity to continually beat back the night. Whale blubber is said to have quite literally lit the Enlightenment, as well as decimating the whales, especially the sperm whale, and risking the lives of thousands of men, many of whom were indigenous, who worked on the whaling ships. The great whale that cannot be caught, that goes into the deep, deep of the waters where there is no light. Oh, Moby Dick. Oh, Ahab. Oh, my country. Even in industrial England, the light pollution as well as the pollution from coal and various forms of oil and gas was abhorred. It all happened together, you know. The decrease of the dark, the removal and the increase of linear and clock time, the separation of people from place, the death of the sperm whale. It was all part of one system and the growth of a cosmovision, which had its origins earlier than this moment, but which became solidified, indoctrinated, and fully in to industrial processes, into institutions and property systems, into systems of measurement and exactness. The pursuit of never-ending light is part and parcel of a cosmovision of incessant, never-ending progress. Which, as I hope you know, means that none of us or our lands and waters and non-human kinfolk are ever really good enough just as we are. There is always something to develop and grow. Sufficiency and satisfaction are sacrificed to the supposed altar of the next goal that is always just out of reach. As Tara McMullen writes in her beautiful book on a more healthy approach to goal setting what works, it is astro- astonishingly difficult to live and qu- work outside of this paradigm of continual improvements. Our cultural DNA, quote, reproduces to consolidate power in a small group of people while convincing everyone else that conforming to those patterns is a moral imperative. What's more, we can see a meta-narrative of overcoming that links these patterns together to create an almost inescapable sense that we are not good enough as we are. After all, if we really were good enough, we'd already be doing better than we are. It often feels like the only way to answer these questions of worthiness is through external validation, and achieving bigger and better goals is one of our primary ways of doing that. By saying yes to more and more, we can feel more useful and thus worthy of the part we play in our families, our workplaces, and our communities. That is, until it all starts to get too much and we hurtle towards burnout. We see this clearly in how we overcommit and overschedule ourselves. We live in a chronically overcommitted culture. We pin our hopes on doing it all. We are fried and frazzled from just trying to keep up with our commitments. Without all the excess commitment and responsibility, we lose the crucial way to reassure ourselves that we are doing okay, that we are still productive members of society, end quote. And in a society where productivity and progress are such core values, ensuring our own productivity, perhaps by becoming great water writers or parents or engineers or philosophers or all of those all at once, is one of the primary ways we have of securing our sense of belonging. And we are fried. Too much heat. 
too much light, not enough support. It's all there in our calendars, the evidence of the overcommitment, and maybe it is there too in the evidence of the burnout, of the sick days and the arguments with our loved ones when it gets to be too much at work, and that then there is another person demanding even more attention. When is it ever enough? In this temporal reality, founded on the uh, shape of linearity and never-ending progress, enoughness is not really a thing. Hence, the whole planet runs out of resources, leading to that whole thing the farmer was talking to me about, that his seasons are no longer dependable cycles. Climate change. You see, we are part of it. Our actions impact the cycles of time. The legacies of colonization influence the cycles of time. <sighs> Let me bring us to a more everyday example. I was bouncing the idea of circular and relational understandings about time versus linear and abstract notions of time with my friend and colleague in India, Rama Subramanian. I've interviewed him before on the podcast, so some of you may have heard me talk about him. He does a lot of work with sustainable livelihoods in Southeast India. Ram told me a story about a soil biologist he was recently talking to in his home state of Tamil Nadu. This particular soil biologist works with a lot of organic farmers, most of whom are women. Ram asked him about how he sees the health of the soil. And how is it that farmers understand the health of the soil if they don't have a really big laboratory full of equipment? He said, well, traditionally, and this works really well, they would look at the cow dung. What's happening with the cow dung is that it's decomposing, which is to say that the microbes, all these little, little tiny spores and microbes in the soil are coming into the cow dung and they are eating it in their own temporal cycles based on the how the, the shape of the cow dung and how fast it's decomposing tells you a lot about the health of the soil. He says that this basic way of understanding is relational and that it's something that really aligns with a lot of what he can find in his laboratory about the overarching health of the soil. Once again, those little microbes come to such, not just usefulness, but as co-conspirators and actors and um, collaborators in our ability, if we know what to look for, of knowing what's happening in our world and, and how what is our health and well-being. Around the same time, Ram also was talking to an insurance company, um, agent from an insurance company, that insurance company said that if the they have a, a very clear understanding, he assured Ram, of what a farm with healthy soil or with a healthy farm should look like based on a calendar. It should produce the plants in a certain period of time, a certain time, and if it fails to do so and something happens such as a event, but it has already failed to produce the plants as it's supposed to be producing the plants, then they deny the farmer the coverage. Within the temporal mindset of the insurance company, everything was linear and based on productivity. Within the temporal mindset of the soil scientists and many of the farmers he works with, it was a more relational and circular understanding of time. These two understandings of time were almost completely contradictory, even though they were working with the same soil the same area, the same part of India, all of them together coming from the same cultural background, or at least they were all Indians in that part of India who had grown up within an hour or so distance from each other. And yet they had vastly different mechanisms and understandings of time. I suppose it wouldn't surprise you to know that there is really no traditional word for insurance company in the lang many languages spoken in Tamil Nadu or other places in South India. It's just a very different way of looking at the world. The 
The rise of screen time and digital time creates its own time warp. And for all that I love my Wi-Fi and my connection to the endless sources of information and people and potential connectivity that exist in the World Wide Web, enabling me to stay on some digital level connected to friends and colleagues and family members outside of the few miles that I walk every day, I am also aware of the dangers that all of these blinking lights bring. Recently, I've taken to wandering at night, to waking up in the dark, to letting myself unplug my cell phone, or rather plug it into a different charger in a different part of the house after a certain time of night. I admit here to being inspired by Clark Strand, whom I mentioned earlier, and his invitation and his even summoning for a revolution of the dark created not by protest or argument or grand plans or the logic that arises from late-night meetings after long days of working, but of simply turning off the lights. I'm aching for cycles, not just darkness, but I can't get to the cycle without the night. Being as I am a creature of cell phones and lamps and computers and insurance companies and switches that go on more often than they go off, I'm trying it to go deeper into the darkness, to give myself enough darkness that I can enjoy it, enough time so that I can talk to those creatures living in the darkness. In the darkness, there's a quiet that touches something internal. The interior and the exterior dance together. I know I don't have to be sleeping. I can sit. I can walk. I can talk to those beings in the darkness who bloom and who sing, who are known by their dark feet and her dark wings. And we can find in the darkness much of what we found in the out-breath and much is what we need to rest When people take circular time with me, they almost always recognize and talk about rest, grief, sadness, death, things that our culture doesn't always give time for, things that we don't always know how to put into our calendars because they don't fit into a linear calendar. They fit into a cycle of life. The rhythms of life, oceans, tides like breath, rivers that coil and retract, waters that rise and fall, rains that come and go, thunder that passes over and makes way for stillness. These are all cycles. Stories embedded in sound waves have shapes and have their own bodies, enabling energetic transmissions between and across generations, cultures, peoples, heartbeats, soul to shining soul. Yet we want We want to not only go, but to return. To ride the somatic cycle of the breath and life is to yearn for both rising and falling. To belong to the cycles of light and dark. To rest at the end of the day. To not burn out. To not be so frazzled. To not have so many things on the calendar. And to still not have enough money in the bank. To be able to relax. To exhale. The end of a season the end of a year, at the end of a lunar cycle, at the beginning of the year, the beginning of a season, the beginning of a lunar cycle. We are creatures of cycles and rhythms. Being embodied means we don't have to go far to come home. The dark always returns. I don't need to make up circular calendars. They came to me in a mystical vision and I lean into them and they have helped me change some of the stories which had become too stuck and too repetitive and that I wasn't anywhere close to, being free. The rhythm of the moon helped. The waxing and waning and darkening helped. In the mind that opens to darkness comes the possibility of cyclical thinking, more based in relationships than productive outcomes, more in tune with the magic of the cosmos and the mysteries of the microbe and the messiness of our bodies, filthy and sexy as they are, living and thriving and dying in time. I suppose here one should say 
one usually says about all the wonders of linearity, of goals and deadlines, of clocks that match each other, which enables things like airplanes to fly and land and global productive measures to happen and really the translation and communication between so many different cultures and places. I am not here completely advocating that we get rid of such things. I really like the fact that there is some type of universal time system. I just don't want it to be the only one that dominates our cosmovision, or rather that our entire cosmovision is forced to become like that universal translation, which leads to a lack of the particularity. It would be as if all you have is the planets, and you don't have the local seasons, and you don't have the local social and meaning-making of your particular place. We need all of them. We need the grand planetary movements. We need the temporal calendars that enable us to have translation across different places. And we need to know where we are. We need to be able to come back into ecological calendar systems. That takes a lot. That takes eons of work, of listening, of talking, of storytelling, of observing. And in a changing planet, that is exactly what we need. Listening, storytelling, engaging. To the local as well as to the global. In time as well as in place. And I suppose here I'm really just touching, just touching the depth and the wonder of the circular, circular, cyclical, dark times. For these are also times of ending and beginning, not just annual cycles, but cycles of times that have been prophesied about for millennia. Times of revelations and revealing, of unveiling and dreaming. We are the ones our ancestors dreamed of. Ancestors are coming back in people's lives in ways that delight and surprise me. My clients regularly tell me of their visions. There are so many people having mystical visions that seem to morph and twist time and space in ways that befuddle any kind of linear system. And as we reclaim temporal cycles and the multi-dimensionality of time, and we reclaim the dark, we can better hear what is being said to us from the Holy Spirit, from the many guides, calling us back to places walked before, teaching us again the meanings of words such as freedom and sacrifice and love. In space and thus in time, there are black holes and wormholes, music and dance and drum beats that travel through and through, stories that can reweave us into the rhythms of being in and of time and space, shimmering through our ancestors' return, memories return, and we ourselves are remembered into a time and space of a place, of a body, of this living Gaia. To know the dark, we go without light, without sight. We remember the presences that dwell there, enchanted and real and luminous and dark those with dark feet and dark wings. We find the dark too blooms and sings. The dark too is traveled by dark feet and dark wings. Thank you so much for listening to the Remembering and Reenchanting podcast. If you are enjoying what you are hearing, please subscribe, share, and leave us a review. I am always happy to hear from you, dear listener, to continue finding ways to connect the disconnected and go deeper on your own journey of remembering and reenchanting with your communities, your organizations, and your families. I invite you to check out our courses and other community offerings via the Sequoia Summit Via website. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. 
though I must admit I spend much more time working with really amazing people than crafting social media. If you want to work with me one-on-one -on -one or bring me to speak at your organization or family office, you can find out more at sarahjolina.com. Thank you.